watching this. Um, I am uh, Jared Dieterle from the R Street uh, Institute Think Tank uh, and uh, study alcohol policy uh, and history for us. Um, and we uh, wanted to put together a, a panel uh, in this uncertain time to talk about uh, some of the uh, trends and uh, policy issues um, going on in the alcohol uh, industry uh, writ large. Um, we, uh, we tried to think about who to be the best people to talk about that, and I'm pretty excited for the uh, panel that we put together. Um, they're gonna be able to, I think, talk about this at a, a very high level. So um, I'm gonna briefly uh, introduce uh, the, uh, the different uh, uh, panelists that are joining us. Um, and then uh, because of the virtual format, I'm probably gonna uh, ask each of them some specific questions. Uh, just so we're not all cross talking over each other, but you know certainly if any of you uh, panelists have, uh, uh, you know want to jump in or say something, feel feel free to do so. Um, we'll try to uh, you know keep this uh, no longer than an hour, um, but I think we have some some cool ground to cover. So um, again, I'll briefly introduce everyone, and then I'll I'll start uh, asking some questions. So I'll start with uh, uh, Chris Swanger, uh, President uh, and CEO of the uh, Distilled Spirits Council uh, of the uh, United States. Um, for those that, that don't know, uh, the Distilled Spirits Council is uh, the leading voice really for distilled spirits in the U.S. Um, it serves as, as kind of the industry's advocate in state uh, legislatures and Congress. Um, Chris uh, himself has uh, many decades of experience um, in the public sector and in the private sector. Uh, he's uh, done everything from working with big global consumer good uh, companies to uh, elected officials. Um, so he has an incredible uh, background of government uh, affairs work um, and a lot of uh, experience in the drinks industry uh, as well. Um, and he, uh, on, according to his uh, bio on the Distilled Spirits site, his favorite drink is uh, a bourbon on the rocks, <laughs> which I, exactly. uh, I think fits. Yeah, yeah. Not bad. Yeah, absolutely. Um, uh, and then uh, also uh, next is uh, Jim uh, McGreevy, who's the president and CEO of the uh, Beer Institute. Uh, the Beer Institute uh, is a, a trade association, uh, for those that don't know, again, of the American brewing industry. They represent both large and small brewers, um, again, for Congress and state legislatures and regulatory agencies. Um, before joining the Beer Institute, uh, Jim uh, was a senior vice president for government affairs at the American Brewers Association and worked as a regulatory and legislative attorney uh, in Minnesota. So again, he has a lot of experience uh, in these areas and in the drinks industry uh, as well. Um, and uh, Jim, unsurprisingly, is a beer guy. Uh, so <laughs> I don't think, again, that's probably a, a surprise to anyone. I, I asked him what beers he likes and he says he likes uh, all beers. So I, I can agree with that. Um, then we have uh, Scott Harris, uh, who's the uh, Founder of uh, Catoctin Creek Distillery uh, in Percival, uh, Virginia, um, just outside uh, DC. For anyone that might be uh, in DC in our audience, it's worth a trip out there once maybe this all uh, clears up. Um, alongside uh, his wife, uh, Becky, Scott founded uh, Catoctin Creek in 2009. Uh, it was actually the first legal distillery in Loudoun County, Virginia since uh, before Prohibition. Uh, which I think is a cool fact. Um, and before becoming a distiller, uh, Scott actually worked in software and IT, wore a, a bunch of different hats, but traded that all in to distill. Um, and he uh, loves, uh, according to his bio, all types of liquor, uh, including whiskey from Scotland, Ireland, the United States, and brandy from France and Germany. Uh, and Catoctin has some wonderful whiskeys uh, and brandy. So, um, and then uh, last but definitely not least is Ryan. Krill, who's the founder of Cape May Brewing Company. Uh, Ryan and uh, his team founded Cape May Brewing uh, in Cape May, New Jersey, uh, of course, in uh, 2011. Uh, and their origin story is, story is pretty cool. They thought that South Jersey uh, was kind of deprived of a good local delicious beer. Uh, and so they stepped into that void. Um, they produce a, a wide variety of uh, cool uh, brews. Um, Chris actually, uh, or excuse me, uh, Ryan, uh, worked in um, uh, uh, finance and real estate, um, and uh, as, as I've seen him put it in some interviews, he traded in the, the six-figure salary and took a leap to uh, go into brewing world, so he's got some uh, cool experience and background as well, uh, and you can often find him sipping on a Cape May uh, IPA um, or any of the other great beers that uh, his brewery produces. Um, okay, uh, we're going to start things off, um, and again, I'm going to uh, 
uh, direct some questions to some of the panelists um, uh, at first to uh, kind of give everyone a, a chance to talk on some different topics and then uh, we can kind of take it from there and see uh, where it goes. Um, so uh, I think I'll uh, actually um, start with uh, you, Jim, if that's okay. Uh, I'd like to get your um, kind of thousand foot view right now of, of the trends in the beer world. Uh, uh, how, where are we in this uh, uh, mid-COVID uh, landscape? What has it done to the beer world? How has it uh, changed the industry? Um, we, we see a lot of kind of news coverage of, oh, alcohol sales are up. Um, and, and I think that, you know, addresses one part of the alcohol markets. Um, but I'm hoping you can talk just at large about what we're seeing, uh, what, what's up, what's down, and how things are changing for, uh, for the beer world. Sure. Well, Jared, thank you very much for the opportunity to uh, talk to uh, all of your listeners and to be on the panel with these, uh, these great panelists. Um, uh, thank you to R Street as well for uh, giving us this opportunity. I, I think, I, gosh, you could, you could spend an hour or 10 just on that one question alone, just talking to me, just talking to me and Ryan about beer. Uh, you don't even have to go into the other uh, sectors of the alcohol business. Uh, but I think generally uh, there's a, a couple major points. The first is uh, it's, it was important from the very beginning of the COVID-19 crisis that beer and alcohol be deemed essential. And they were deemed essential by the uh, Department of Homeland Security and by really all governors and uh, jurisdictions in the United States. I think that was, uh, was critical uh, for uh, understanding for the, for the business owners, big companies, big multinational companies, and, and small companies like Ryan's and Scott's to understand where we fit sort of in American society and American culture and in American, and in American commerce. Um, in, important for the distributors to understand that they could still put their trucks on the, on the streets and uh, important for retailers to understand that um, uh, they could sell our products. We are part of the grocery system um, and that is super important in the United States and it has allowed our industries by and large to uh, remain operating. Obviously, the vagaries and difficulties of the marketplace uh, dictate what that means for the individual businesses, of which there are 8,000 individual brewery businesses throughout the United States. So, um, uh, you know, and when 20% of your uh, marketplace is closed, completely closed, locked up, uh, unavailable for uh, selling, um, that's going to affect the business. So, we're certainly seeing. Um, all kinds of entrepreneurial ways from all kinds of companies to understand how they can keep producing their products and how they can keep selling them. So, but this essential designation, I think, was very critical at the end, uh, at the very beginning. And then as we make our way through uh, the, 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 the crisis, uh, we're getting sort of to the end of it. Uh, we're started talking, starting to talk about the reopening and recovery phase. You're starting to see governors every day announce uh, phased openings of their, uh, of their economies in their states. I think I saw Gina Raimondo, governor of Rhode Island, make her announcement uh, yesterday. Governor Cuomo in New York had some, uh, some things to say about this. Uh, we saw Mike DeWine yesterday in Ohio. I think uh, Charlie Baker in Massachusetts is about to announce his reopening, uh, his state's reopening. Um, it'll be also very important for us to watch and to uh, advocate for uh, the opening of retail um, uh, on premise. So whatever that means, I know in Texas, I think that means as of this Friday, um, uh, twenty five percent uh, restaurants will be open. will be able to open with about twenty five percent capacity. I think that's going to be very important for our industry going forward to understand how that on premise reopening happens. Um, but Really, at the end of the day, being able to stay in business has been a very important part of, uh, of how we all get through this. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah, I appreciate that. Um, and definitely there's, there's more to unpack there that we can talk about uh, as we go along. But uh, Chris, uh, could, could I ask you to uh, give kind of a similar uh, overview of uh, distilled spirits, um, where, uh, where that sits right now, uh, similar to what Jim did uh, for beer? You bet. Uh, and thank you, R Street, for having us. Uh, uh, certainly, as Jim alluded to, uh, uh, you know, with the federal government and uh, all but almost all of the state governments deeming the retail sale of alcohol as essential uh, 
uh, was a, a critical component to it all. Early on, you know, based on uh, Nielsen numbers, certainly there's been an uptick in the off-premise business. That's for the, you know, the, the mom and pop uh, retail stores and so forth, uh, where we're at a 25% uptick uh, from previous year. Uh, but the impact on the bars and, and, and the restaurants are significant. And, uh, you know, we worked very, very closely with, our, uh, with Jim and the Beer Institute and our wine partners as well. Uh, real impact on our, our distilleries around the country, and, and Scott Harris can talk about that because they've all but had to shut down their tours and uh, – Many of their sales reside right there at the distillery. And uh, so, but look, uh, an anxious time for the industry. I think uh, beverage alcohol has played uh, a positive kind of role for helping people just take a break uh, to enjoy themselves with all the pressures of it. You know, that goes into uh, the importance of moderation and you know, responsibility messaging as well. Uh, but uh, a lot of uncertain times ahead. And, uh, you know, the Distilled Spirits Council is going to be working very, very closely with the National Restaurant Association and many of the state restaurant and retail associations as well to help support uh, the reopening of the economy. I would also say in early on, uh, you know, the impact on bartenders and uh, uh, waiters in the restaurants are pretty significant. And uh, I'm proud to say our member companies uh, quickly uh, jumped up and has contributed over $12 million to the U.S. Bartenders Guild to help them because many of those great bartenders are, are suffering from not getting a paycheck. So uh, sure. a lot more work ahead. Uh, you know, you read the headlines that, you know, uh, alcohol sales are going through the roof. Uh, the COVID-19 crisis is posing a lot of challenges that are on our industry. And, uh, you know, the industry is working closely with the state gover governments to find creative ways to keep those small businesses open and keeping the hospitality industry strong uh, when we rebound from all of this. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, now uh, I want to uh, turn. I, that gives us some, a good overview of, of where things stand generally, and then uh, and I want to uh, ask Ryan and uh, Scott about kind of what they're seeing on the ground um, in uh, their individual uh, establishments. But but Ryan, we'll we'll start with you. Um, uh, how has the pandemic affected kind of your day to day job? A but B also what's it doing to your sales numbers? Um, I, uh, from from what I understand, my in-laws tell me that your beer is sold in Philadelphia and other places uh, off premise. So I'm assuming that um, that you know if they're buying it down there, uh, then then probably other people are as well. But but I'm sure also your tap room, on the other hand, has uh, has struggled. So so what are things looking like uh, for you, and how has this impacted you? Sure. So we distribute our beer in New Jersey, southeastern Pennsylvania, and just recently Delaware. And um, we do have a tasting room. It's in a, a small but very important part of our business. So starting there, the tasting room is totally shut down. We do have some uh, beer to go sales. Mm -hmm. and, uh, and recently we were given the privilege from the governor to be able to do home delivery. And while that's helpful, I think it's mostly a morale boost. It's not really going to plug the hole that is the gap of any lost revenue from the tasting room. Um, and then all of our uh, on-premise customers, the bars and restaurants, they're completely shut down. Right. And we're not certain on when they're going to reopen. The governor just released a, uh, uh, some guidance on when things will reopen, but it wasn't enough to uh, give a definitive uh, action for us to be able to do something with. And then off-premise, we're seeing uh, the same as what Chris mentioned. Uh, there's a big uptick in all the liquor stores in New Jersey and Pennsylvania and Delaware. And, um, but a lot of that we find is panic buying and it's kind of leveling out to a new normal, just slightly above uh, what we had anticipated. But just like the tasting room, it's not really enough to fill the gap. So for the first part of the year, we're actually on, uh, on target for, to meet our, for, our forecast. So we anticipated selling uh, roughly about 31,000 barrels of beer this year. And uh, Q1, we hit that target, we actually exceeded that target. But now going into April and May, uh, and the rest of Q2 and into Q3, where those two quarters we make 
two thirds of our revenue, that's really the most uncertainty. So we did a number of different scenario planning and we anticipate being somewhere uh, close to flat for last year, which is a good thing, both in revenue and in terms of barrels. So we're reformulating our budgets to look like that. And then if we're able to exceed that for some reason, that would be gravy. But what we're anticipating is a very slow reopening of uh, bars and restaurants at the shore and, uh, and then package to continue to, to increase a little bit. But if you're not gonna have a barbecue um, and if you're not gonna have a barbecue with you know, your friends and family over, you're not gonna buy a case of beer uh, to just drink at home by yourself. Sure, sure, yeah, yeah. And I, I definitely wanna uh, circle back a little later to the uh, delivery um, situation in New Jersey, which, which I know affected you. Um, uh, but uh, first, Scott, um, uh, you know, similarly, how has the uh, uh, pandemic uh, affected you uh, in terms of, of your sales numbers? I know you all have a, a very nice uh, uh, tasting room in, in Percival um, that uh, is, is a fun place to, to stop by. Um, how, how has that been impacted um, and how have you been able to make up for it if you have been able to with, uh, with other off-premise sales? Yeah, when this whole pandemic um, hit, we shut down the tasting room, you know, uh, pretty much when the governor uh, mandated that all um, uh, gatherings of 10 or more were um, to be shut down. Um, so people, you know, stopped coming. Um, the tasting room for us represents probably about 25% of our um, total revenue. So all of that was gone overnight. Um, we also then have business in the metropolitan Washington DC area is, is a big region for us, plus all of our national business. Um, I've heard that you know retail um, liquor chain sales are way up. Um, I have not yet seen that depletion data to show that, you know, to give me some confidence for that. So I'm a little bit nervous about that. Um, so we'll, we'll see if that is indeed the case. Um, the uh, restaurant sales, of course, which represents about half of our wholesale business, um, completely went to zero, you know, it was just decimated overnight. Um, so for us, there were a couple silver linings in all of this. At that exact time that we were doing all that, um, we pivoted and started making hand sanitizer almost right away. And we were able to do that because we have federal alcohol permits that allow us to buy bulk alcohol. So I'd say first and foremost, you know, we weren't making sanitizer out of alcohol that we produce ourselves because we're a craft whiskey distillery and we can't make um, alcohol cheap enough, fast enough to make it into hand sanitizer, you know, like you would use say for making vodka or something like that. So we purchased all the bulk alcohol ingredients and started making hand sanitizer very quickly. And we're able to repurpose our salespeople who were, um, you know, not necessary out in the field anymore. No restaurants want to hear from a salesperson when they're facing a shutdown. Um, and so all of our sales team came in and started bottling hand sanitizer. So it was good in that we could, um, you know, bring those people in and keep them employed. Um, and the hand sanitizer, um, we were basically able to create enough revenue to keep the business going as well. So that was a blessing um, in some sense. And we were able to contribute to the community, which felt good as well. Um, the other aspect that changed for us dramatically was about two weeks ago, the governor um, and the ABC, Virginia ABC, which is a control state, authorized for us to start shipping via common carrier like FedEx and UPS. Mm -hmm. And that first week, on the first day we had 80 orders and on the second day we had 80 orders and on the third day we had 60 orders and it was just overwhelming. We had to turn our business from, you know, selling bottles like a liquor store to Amazon, you know, where we're packaging boxes and sending things out. So we had to lay in a truckload of un unpacked boxes and wine shippers and all this stuff. It was just really crazy. But the revenue that we, um, that we received from it in that first week was like having 10 good Saturdays in one day. It was incredible, absolutely incredible. So that was a blessing. Um, the direct to shipping, um, direct to consumer shipping option right now is tied to the COVID crisis. So there's a possibility that the governor um, or the ABC could take it away when this is all done. And we're not really sure how that's gonna play out. Yeah, uh, that, that's uh, definitely something I've been watching closely. In, uh, for those uh, uh, unfamiliar with uh, Virginia, as, as Scott mentions, they uh, are temporarily allowing distilleries to uh, directly ship, which was new to uh, consumers uh, in Virginia, and, and then uh, also do uh, on-demand or hand delivery, which you know helps more probably the urban distilleries than some of the ones that are outside our urban conclaves. Um, that's that's been made. That part of it's been made permanent, the, the delivery, direct delivery, um, but everyone's kind of waiting to see what will 
happened with the uh, shipping, which leads me to, to my next question. There's been, um, and all of you have just touched upon it one way or the other of, of, um, of how we're going to navigate this new normal and then eventually, um, which, which we can get to later, transition in, in, you know, into post uh, COVID landscape. But uh, a lot of the drinks writers that I follow, even ones that aren't necessarily policy uh, writers have, have talked uh, about you know, how difficult there may be no easy answers. Um, you can't immediately duplicate um, going back to you know, everyone being in, in bars on, on a Friday night uh, in the same way. Maybe bars will look different. Uh, maybe breweries, maybe distilleries will look different uh, when, when we return. But um, it seems like one of the, uh, maybe one arrow in, in the quiver is, has been some of this uh, deregulatory wave that we've seen uh, in, in the industry. Um, again, you know, as, as Ryan touched upon, it, it probably isn't going to make up everything. Um, and I don't uh, want to oversell as much as I love deregulation. I don't want to oversell that it's going to be a, a cure-all uh, for everything. But um, I, I'd, uh, I'd love uh, to get, um, you touched on it a little bit, Scott, so maybe we'll start with you and then, and then circle back around with everyone. Um, you mentioned how important shipping has been to you. Is that something that you foresee if, if it were made permanent going forward would A, help ease the transition back, but then B, still comprise an important part of your business going forward? Yeah, so definitely A, it would help us ease the transition back because I do think these are gonna be slow ramp ups and um, you know, people are still able to buy this product from us and we can ship it to them. So yeah, that would probably be good to, to keep that and ease that back. Um, I would say if we, if we do get back to some kind of normal where we have the tasting room running and doing events and, and service in there, right now the tasting room is our shipping station. You know, so that's where we have all these boxes laid out and big bales of bubble wrap and all kinds of stuff. So we'd have to figure out a new place to do that um, if we get back to normal and need the tasting room for service, which would be a good problem to have. Sure, sure. Yeah, no, absolutely. And then uh, Ryan, you know, what about you? You mentioned that you felt like the delivery is, has been helpful. For those unfamiliar with the New Jersey situation, maybe you could talk about that a little bit. Uh, New Jersey was one of the um, uh, few states I had seen early on that actually uh, seemed to kind of go against the grain and say that delivery couldn't happen uh, from breweries, whereas a lot of other states were liberalizing that. Um, and, and I know that uh, created a lot of concern, of course, uh, in, in uh, your state. Um, and then eventually the, they recanted on that uh, a week or two later and are now allowing it. Um, but uh, can you just talk about that a little bit? And I know you mentioned it may not be a huge part of your business, but is that something you'd hope to see continue in the post-COVID uh, 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 landscape? Sure. So um, when the governor started shutting down uh, businesses and putting the shelter in place orders uh, throughout New Jersey, uh, we were really surprised to learn that the governor had included home delivery for breweries. Uh, that's a privilege that uh, we did not ask for nor expect, but were uh, pleasantly surprised. So um, uh, you know, us and the other 120 or so breweries that are in New Jersey started taking steps to set up systems uh, to be able to safely deliver. And, um, and then about maybe a week later, we learned that that was being rescinded because of the language the governor put forth in the executive order. And um, so that was a disappointing blow with all the uh, kind of the bad news that was happening. And we lobbied for about two weeks and we were able to get it turned around and reopened through uh, an order through the ABC director that allowed special privilege during this time of crisis. Now we have a bill that has been introduced to the legislature that would make this permanent during times of economic crisis or um, state of emergency. But certainly we would uh, hope for the privilege of being able to deliver uh, do home delivery consistently. And uh, we think that's consistent with buying habits. People are you know, expecting now to be able to go online and get what they want and they have it shipped home or and home delivered. So um, you know, we're hopeful that that is the case, but the, the main priority is really trying to get, get reopened and stabilize, stabilize our businesses and try to get back to some kind of normal. Sure, sure. And then uh, shifting back to uh, Jim and, and Chris, um, uh, those are obviously, uh, to uh, individual situations um, in, in Virginia and New Jersey, but um, you know, overall, what have been some of the uh, policy changes that, that you all have uh, seen um, uh, because that, that kind of are now temporary, that have been reactive type stuff from, from state regulators? And then um, you know, what else is needed? Is it, is it uh, you know, 
the, the tariffs uh, really uh, roiled the alcohol industry a lot over the past couple of years. Is, is it uh, tariff reprieves? Is it uh, additional tax um, relief? Uh, what what uh, has been done and what more kind of needs to be done? We can start with uh, with Jim and then go to Chris. Yeah, you know, I, uh, I think what we need to do is make sure that uh, on-premise facilities, including tap rooms and uh, of all kinds, uh, can have the opportunity to to continue to to begin to grow again, mm -hmm. um, but when it comes to the on-premise bars and restaurants, uh, there's a number of different proposals that are out there that uh, I think would be very helpful in terms of stabilization funds for restaurants. We uh, and others in the beer industry called for a similar stabilization fund for the beer industry. Very important. Um, tariff relief is something that. Um, uh, we all would like to see, uh, but a little harder to get from a, from a political perspective, uh, um, uh, given the president's views on tariffs. Um, we have a specific issue in beer, which I, I think is uh, extremely important. Uh, beer is uh, a lot more perishable than, uh, than wine and spirits. Um, and because of the closure of the tap rooms, because of the closure of bars and restaurants around the country, we've got um, millions of kegs uh, and multi-millions of dollars of inventory that's uh, spoiling in the locations that they're at now. So um, we are talking to members of Congress about uh, finding some way to get some relief from, a, from, from them uh, in, the, in, future, in future bills uh, because of this gigantic amount of unmerchantable beer that's in the marketplace right now. And we see others in the food and beverage sector who have that similar problem. So we're talking to others, uh, others to see if there's a way that we could all work together. Um, but that's an issue that comes from this pandemic that isn't like the first thing you think about yeah. when you think about COVID-19. And I would imagine that there are uh, any number of industries with any number of similar problems that are important. And then I guess finally, in my view, um, uh, this ri raises the uh, policy need to get permanency of our tax relief, excise tax relief uh, uh, program as soon as possible. Um, uh, for, your, for your viewers, um, Beer, Wine and Spirits received, an excise ta received excise tax relief in December of 2017. Um, uh, it was uh, temporary. It needs to be uh, continually or regularly extended and or made permanent. And many of us uh, on the panel here have been talking about making it permanent. So I think um, all of the issues that we see related to sales and the difficulty of the marketplace make excise tax relief permanency uh, a critical thing that Congress should do either through some uh, pandemic relief bills or through some other measure before the end of the year. Yeah, that's a, that's a good point. We've uh, at our street written quite a bit about the um, excise tax, tax relief. That's a good example of something that wasn't even uh, really uh, COVID related uh, uh, on a temporary basis, but still was made temporary and that creates a lot of uncertainty for businesses. Chris, uh, uh, what, what are your thoughts uh, on, on uh, what policy changes have been done so far that have been helpful and then what, what more can be done? Well, one thing on the Craft Beverage Modernization Tax Reform Act that Jim was referring to, uh, uh, we're working uh, together with our coalition to try to make that permanent because it'll give the Ryans and the Scots some, uh, some predictability in managing their business. And that's very, very important in this unpredictable world. Uh, Look, we were very, very pleased when uh, uh, Governor Cuomo, he's an example, and other governors have allowed for the pickup of beverage alcohol uh, when people order a uh, pickup for their dinner. Uh, that's great for the restaurants. Uh, it's great for the consumers and so forth, just as long as that product is handled safely and so forth. So uh, we've seen a lot of these emergency rules that really complement the changing marketplace, right? The marketplace has shifted so dramatically over the last 10 years. And it's just what has happened in terms of uh, driving consumer convenience and so forth. Uh, you know, some of these market changes are going to be changes that we're all going to uh, be grappling with, particularly within the beverage alcohol industry. And uh, I think uh, certainly is, I think the ramp up of the economy is going to be slow. Uh, you know, we would call on state governors to leave some of these emergency rules that they've put in place. 
in for at least the rest of the year because it's going to take a long time for these bars and restaurants to really get up and running at full capacity, particularly when you're starting with a, you know, a 25% capacity rule. So I think there is an opportunity, I think, for the industry uh, to drive more consumer convenience and adapt to the new marketplace. And it may take some time to get back uh, to where we were before March 11th and March uh, 12th when everything started to uh, be shut down. And, uh, you know, I think uh, uh, it does present an opportunity, uh, you know, as, as Jim is, or I mean, as uh, Scott Harris is really being able to survive based on the direct shipping needs. Uh, obviously, that, that's an important element for many of these craft distillers. And the DTC issue has been, you know, long debated uh, within the industry. The industry, you know, lives within the framework of what's called the three-tier system, where the product goes from supplier to distributor and to retailer. And the three-tier system is a very important foundation for the industry and the regulation of the product. But the industry is going to have to navigate through some of these pretty significant market trends, make sure that uh, working with our distributor and our retail partners to make sure that we all adapt to the marketplace and the needs of the consumers. Uh, so it's going to be an interesting time for the industry as we navigate uh, support you know, certainly our distributor and our retail partners as they open up and support the bars and restaurants. On Capitol Hill, uh, another big issue for us, uh, about three, four weeks ago, Treasury Department announced the deferral of the federal excise tax payment, and that has provided some needed relief uh, for brewers and vintners and distillers, and I think we would hope uh, that uh, that deferral of having to pay the federal excise tax is extended past July because uh, everybody is grappling with the uncertainty of it. And we're working closely with, with the Beer Institute and the Wine Institute and others uh, to make sure that gets extended as well. Uh, so uh, uh, tariffs, you know, that's a bigger political issue, but we're hoping and calling on both the U.S. and the EU to get together and really negotiate some of these tough, tough issues because uh, tariffs, 25% tariff on American whiskey has had a direct impact on Scott Harris's business and many American whiskey businesses. So we need to get the U.S. and the EU in the negotiating room and get some of these big issues resolved related to steel and aluminum or aircraft parts subsidies and so forth. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I think, Jared, I think Chris makes a good point. You know, when he says we have to figure out how to navigate through, uh, through all of these different uh, stakeholders and different priorities. Um, uh, we are a regulated industry. We are, uh, we are definitely in the middle of the political process in terms of, in terms of what that regulation should be. Um, and uh, or what it should be over the long run. So I, th I think, you know, these temporary privileges, some of them will be driven by the consumer uh, to be turned into something more long term if, if that happens. Um, but we're certainly in a, in a uh, significant political process that needs to be uh, where we need to hear from all the different stakeholders in the industry. And, and really for us at this point, uh, we estimated through June that the, the COVID-19 pandemic is a $8 billion hit to uh, our uh, economic uh, contribution to the United States. So, you know, a phased and approach that Chris talks about in a, in a variety of different ways, I think would be, uh, would be very important. Yeah, yeah, and you both uh, mentioned um, navigating uh, uh, kind of the um, uncertain landscape and uncertainty is always so difficult for businesses. I, I wanna, um, uh, luckily, I think one of the, the neat things about uh, both Ryan and, and Scott's perspective is that they've uh, been in the industry for a while. They were started two years ago. Um, and and uh, I'd like to we can start with Scott, but I'd like to get both of your um, uh, input on, um, and I know Scott, particularly with you, you, you kind of started uh, out, of, out of the last recession in, in 2009. Um, and it, how does that compare to right now as far as uh, the uncertainty in the industry um, and do you think there will be, how do you think the industry will, will uh, survive this? Is there going to be consolidation, do you predict, from a lot of uh, other dis distilleries? Um, what, do you, uh, what do you think are, um, are kind of what, what, what's on the horizon, I guess, is what I'm trying to say, for, for uh, small craft distillers like yourself? 
Yeah, it's an interesting point. Um, in 2009, when we were doing this, you know, just to put it in context, you know, we were learning about words like too big to fail, uh, Lehman Brothers, countrywide mortgage collapsed, right? And so um, it, it was a, a really desperate time um, for the stock market and for people's um, personal finances. Um, we made our decision to start the distillery partly out of that desperation. So my wife and I were looking at our life savings, you know, that we had both raised as two engineers working in the market and saw it going down quickly. And we were like, we need to use this money quickly before it disappears entirely, right? So that was basically our, our goal. And, and we saw some opportunities in like rent for commercial spaces and things were getting, you know, low and available. And so we were able to, to use that time um, as an opportunity for, for starting our business. Um, the tagline of our business case at that time that we were giving to banks was the, the old tagline, when times are good, people drink. When times are bad, people drink. And the banks just loved it. So anyway, um, in comparison to how we are today, however, I don't think it even compares. You know, I think this could be 10 times worse than that recession that we had. You know, we didn't see unemployment in the large double digits coming out all at once within it's been what three weeks four weeks that this has been happening um so i'm really nervous and bearish on the future if we don't pull out of this by summer and this drags on and on and on it's going to have a major major impact um hospitality businesses restaurants um are going to go out of business and never come back many of them and and that's detrimental obviously to them it's detrimental all the way up the supply chain to people like us um and that's very worrisome um as far as other distilleries, um, you know, and, and I would assume so with breweries as well, if, if they were already on shaky footing, the, this is going to put them under. We know of one brewery here in town that, that went under immediately because of it. They were just like, it's too much. We can't do it. Um, so I would expect to see, unfortunately, some sizable percentage of craft businesses, whether it's breweries, wineries, or distilleries, probably go out um, if this prolongs much longer. Ryan, what's uh, what's your perspective on this? I think a lot of a lot of the craft breweries are very small. I think the average barrel size it used to be a thousand barrels, and now I think it's even less than that um, of the eight thousand or so breweries that are in the U.S. And a lot of them are really dependent on their tasting room. So if their tasting room is shut down, you're not doing anything. We're in the really fortunate spot where the majority of our beer is being sold to retail, so it's going outside of our four walls. And, um, but we're, we're certainly concerned. We're concerned about our on-premise customers. We did a survey of our, of our customers and we suspect <clears throat> we have about 1% are in the, the not gonna reopen category, about 15% in the uh, maybe reopen category, which I think is still being um, pretty optimistic. So there's also, I mean, but from this is gonna be a lot of opportunity. And so we, you know, we, before even any of this happened, we've been approached by a couple of breweries that uh, we're looking for an exit strategy. I mean, it's not necessarily sustainable to have so many, so many breweries uh, and have a clear point of differentiation. It's just uh, the yeah. unfortunate truth. So I think it's to Scott's point, I think it's gonna really accelerate any kind of, any kind of closure that was already gonna happen. Yeah, absolutely. Um, well, yeah, this is great. So uh, by the way, for anyone that's watching, um, I, I already announced this in the chat. You're welcome to su uh, submit some questions either in the chat feature or Q&A. We already have a couple that have rolled in um, that, that I think are worthwhile. Um, so I'm going to uh, ask them here to uh, the panel. Um, uh, the first one is uh, 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 maybe a, a beer question. Um, uh, you can have uh, Jim and, and Ryan talk about, but uh, uh, Victorino asks, rather than let all the beer go to waste and it expire, uh, like in the kegs, uh, as you uh, had mentioned, um, is there a way to get local, uh, to locally get that beer from the closed bars or stadiums or places that can't use them uh, and get them to consumers? Uh, is, is that feasible? Um, is, has anyone tried that or what, what, what's the situation there? Well, I see. Go ahead, Ryan. So we already have beer that's in inventory, that's in kegs, yeah. that's at our warehouse yeah. that, you know, we're looking at the date codes and then plus all the beer that's already sitting at bars and restaurants. And then also at our wholesale partners that, um, you know, we're watching and, and then that's just the untapped beer. Then there's all the tap beer that's already sitting there. So we, you know, we're not necessarily going to take that ke a half keg, half used keg of beer and try to sell it. Uh, the reality is that people just don't really 
drink that, you know, buy that many kegs of beer uh, at home. They certainly have that option, but I think there's just so much beer that's in the trade. That's not a realistic option. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's true. I mean, you know, there really is no secondary market for keg beer. Moreover, there's an issue of, uh, uh, as we call decanting the beer, getting the beer out of the kegs uh, when they're not in a retail location. Uh, there's environmental issues, there's uh, safety issues. So it's unfortunate. Uh, we hate to see all this great beer go to waste, um, but uh, that's the prospect we have the longer this goes on. Yeah, yeah. Uh, great. Yeah. And then um, uh, another question we got are a couple variants of, of this question. Um, uh, I'm going to analogize some of the um, uh, 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 comparisons people have been making with the Spanish flu, and I know some alcohol historians have thought maybe that contributed in some way to uh, prohibition. Um, but there's concern um, from a lot of people that this will lead to more um, regulation or taxes on alcohol. I think, you know, temporarily we've seen the opposite of that, but I think that's always a concern people have. I'd love to, um, we start with Chris on this, because I know there's been, a, I guess, a a mini version of, uh, I don't want to be overwrought and say prohibition, but a, a mini version of closing down uh, liquor stores in uh, Pennsylvania, uh, most prominently. Um, and and uh, what, uh, can you talk about some of the um, unintended consequences uh, that has, um, and it's led to a lot of difficulties in Pennsylvania versus states that have kind of just allowed more legal access uh, for alcohol. Um, but uh, what lessons do you think that hopefully we will learn from situations like Pennsylvania uh, going forward when crises like this happen? Yeah, you know, uh, in the heat of the moment, the, the governor, you know, of uh, Pennsylvania, you know, made, made the decision to, to shut down all the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board stores in the state. And that kind of had a, a counter effect probably in terms of what uh, the governor intended. Uh, many Pennsylvania consumers started uh, driving cross-border to New Jersey, and West Virginia, and Delaware to go pick up product, and that was the last thing I'm sure he intended uh, to happen because he wanted people to shelter in place. Many, many, Pennsylvania is a control state uh, for the sale and distribution of distilled spirits. In many control states, to their credit, uh, found creative paths to make sure to, to minimize entry into the stores, to pick up and so forth. And I think uh, the lessons in Virginia are, are something that will be written about for, for a, long, long, a long time, right? Uh, the circumstances in Virginia uh, were very problematic and probably did not serve the intent uh, by the governor. And uh, we're now starting to see uh, the Pennsylvania Liquor Control Board looking for ways to, for delivery and pick up at the stores and so forth. So that's an example of how not to do it and the lessons as a result. Because uh, even uh, some of the neighboring states had to shut down. They were getting so much traffic uh, that they had to shut it down uh, to sell the product only uh, for uh, uh, residents of their state and so forth. But mm -hmm. look, I, you know, the other thing I just want to put a plug in here uh, is, you know, it, it, I've been proud to represent an industry, you know, Scott Harris is one of them, but many, many, many distillers around the country quickly pivoted to help make hand sanitizer. And to, to this day, there's still a great shortage of hand sanitizer, but we've got over 720 distilleries. Uh, Discus created a portal. Uh, so uh, all the distillers that were getting involved in, in, in large part in the beginning, really contributing hand sanitizer to the emergency responder community, mm -hmm. hospitals and so forth. Uh, was really just donating hand sanitizer to get it out in the community. So mm -hmm. as we ramp the economy back up, the demand for hand sanitizer will only increase. Uh, so we've learned a lot about hand sanitizer over the last month, month and a half, and that's just a testament of American ingenuity and perseverance. You know, we've worked closely with the FDA. We had some fits and starts with the FDA a little bit in terms of some of their guidances, but it's important for the industry to follow uh, the FDA guidelines and the World Health Organization guidelines. But in, in some of the brewers have also uh, gotten into the hand sanitizer business as well. So, you know, the, the good news, despite all the trials and tribulations, the COVID crisis has imposed on our great industry. 
you know, the industry has really, really stepped up and is really on the front lines to be part of the solution, uh, certainly in terms of the hand sanitizer issue. Uh, and, you know, that, that is an, an important ingredient for us all, you know, staying safe and ultimately defeating uh, the, the virus altogether. So. Yeah, it's been a wonderful example of the brewers and distillers that uh, I'm glad that you pointed that out and emphasized it. I've been working on the hand sanitizer stuff. It's been, as you said, a great example of a private initiative. Um, and it's, it's been, I think, heartening to see. Um, there's been some good news amidst uh, all the, the bad news that we're seeing. Um, well, speaking of the uh, non-essential uh, essential designation, um, uh, yeah, Jim had actually brought this point up um, uh, at one point when I was uh, uh, chatting with him and also in his opening remarks, but it's not, there's obviously the issue of, you know, uh, whether the, the stores themselves are essential that are selling alcohol, but then it's also up the supply chain that, that, that provide the ingredients and uh, all the um, uh, things that go into actually producing uh, alcohol. So it might be a question for Ryan and Scott, but certainly, uh, you know, uh, Jim and uh, Chris, you're welcome to chime in uh, after that as well. But um, Ryan, we'll start with you. Have you noticed any supply chain issues in getting uh, your raw materials or packaging during uh, this crisis? Is that, uh, have you kind of any of your suppliers been shut down or not able to work during this? Is that, is that affect you at all? Uh, the one thing that has gotten our attention was the supply of CO2. Mm -hmm. And um, for now, we've, we've been actually okay but as a result, <laughs> Jim can probably articulate this better than I can, but as a result of, uh, I guess, the issue going on between Russia and Saudi Arabia has uh, created some ethanol production issues, which is a lot of CO2 is, uh, where a lot of CO2 is produced. So mm -hmm. we've been hearing from other breweries that they have uh, been having CO2 shortages. Uh, we did get notice from our supplier that uh, there may be a premium increase during this uh, state of emergency uh, but everything else, we've been able to get all of our raw materials. So, uh, Scott, how about, uh, how about you? Yes, um, thankfully, you know, we work with a lot of local farmers to get grain. Uh, and farmers have not had any um, issues with grain um, and are happy to keep providing it. Um, the, uh, the other major ingredients that we, we get are barrels, of course, lots of lots of wood. Um, and that's American made. So that's been pretty easy to continue to get. Um, the one issue or the one area where we're feeling very fortunate is a lot of um, uh, whiskey makers and, and spirits people um, get glass from um, overseas, China particularly. And uh, we, uh, about eight years ago, um, started using Anchor Hawking glass, which is out of Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. So it's only about four hours from our distillery. And as a result of that decision, we had no idea at the time, of course, um, we've had no shortages of glass. Our glass makers up in Pennsylvania are still working and providing us glass. So um, we're very lucky in that regard that we've been able to keep our whiskey production um, going pretty much at the same levels that we had pre-COVID. Jim uh, or Chris, do either of you want to uh, chime in on that? It, it, it's okay if not, but uh, I know that it's something that, that has been on the industry's mind, certainly. Certainly, yeah. I, would, I would just say, uh, you know, monitoring the supply chain and the impact of that. I mean, one of the reasons why we stood up the, the portal was just to give a one-stop shop access point on uh, supplies as it relates to hand sanitizer, whether it's the packaging, the product, uh, or the denaturants that are included in it. So, uh, and certainly, you know, with our distributor partners getting the product out to the off-premise chain and so forth, and supporting our retail partners, uh, uh, it's a it's a critical element, and I think as Jim said at the at the very beginning, recognizing that these businesses are essential uh, to the economy uh, was was a critical component, uh, at least uh, for the industry to keep its head above water uh, during these uh, unique times. Yeah, I know. Uh, yeah, it's interesting. You know, um, this this overlay of uh, the essential designation, as Chris has said, has been so important. Uh, but then there are these, as I said er earlier, myriad of, of issues that just seem to pop up that uh, no one would ever think about. And I think that CO2 issue that Ryan talks about is, is one of those. Uh, the lowering price of gas, the dramatic decline in the price of oil, um, along with the fact that people aren't driving uh, distances that they used to drive every day, um, has led to many, many ethanol plants in this country closing 
uh, and uh, at least a small portion of those ethanol plants were, were the ones capturing CO2 that was, were then sold to brewers and other end users. So without those ethanol plants capturing that CO2, uh, uh, there has been a growing concern about the, um, the supply of CO2, both from a price perspective and from a, uh, an actual supply perspective. So um, it's something that uh, is not uh, universal in beer in terms of brewers uh, and in terms of uh, all across the country, it seems like the CO2 supply issue is a, and sometimes a regional issue uh, more than anything else. But um, it's something again that this pandemic has just brought to life that uh, was just something that um, was a normal part of business that was not a problem until it yeah. became a problem. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Uh, by the way, before we go on, uh, there's a little levity here. Um, uh, this is for Ryan. Uh, Victorino, which asked the question about the kegs, uh, he said that uh, he will, when he goes to Cape May this summer, will buy kegs from you. So you have at least uh, one. <laughs> All right, Victorino, we'll reserve it for you. Yeah, 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 exactly. Um, uh, uh, next thing that we got a question about, um, was uh, a direct to consumer shipping again um, or delivery, which was mentioned, um, and whether this will accelerate the trend uh, towards that. Um, if we're going to be seeing more states allowing that, Kentucky just passed uh, a version of a, of a law um, uh, allowing that. Of course, then distilleries are doing it um, uh, now, at least temporarily uh, in, in Virginia, as we mentioned. But is that something that? Um, I'm really curious to get um, you know any or all of your perspectives on this. We can uh, um, start with uh, I guess Chris. Um, you know, do you think that we could be seeing a move towards more states allowing direct consumer shipping? I would have to say you know the political pressure points are going to be elevated just because of the dramatic change in the marketplace, and I think it's going to be incumbent upon the industry to work together and find some common ground. Uh, you know, is uh, you know, beverage alcohol is a regulated product, and we want to make sure that uh, any uh, direct shipping issues uh, follow uh, an appropriate regulatory scheme to make sure that product is being distributed to uh, uh, legal purchase age adults and so forth. So, but I think you know that the, the pressure has been building for quite some time. Uh, there's uh, significant direct shipping of wine and uh, those those questions and partial points for the distilled spirits industry and, and, and maybe a little bit lesser for the brewing industry as well. I defer to Ryan and Jim on that, but uh, I, I think the, the discussion around direct shipping and how do we do it and how do we navigate it uh, with our with our distributor partners and our retail partners is going to be an important element. And certainly the COVID crisis what uh, the benefits that Scott is seeing as a result of uh, what the Virginia ABC has allowed uh, is gonna just kind of beg the question uh, for sure. Uh, and it's something that we're gonna have to contend with and find, find a path to meet consumer needs. Uh, the, 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 uh, as delivery of beverage alcohol has really, uh, really blossomed over the last month or so, that's another component, the delivery of beverage alcohol is in large part can be done within the three tier system and uh, you know, supporting uh, you know, uh, a path for greater delivery of beverage alcohol within the three tier system is something that the industry can do as well. And then obviously trying to find some common ground on the direct shipping issue too. Jim, do you, you want to chime in on that? We can go to Scott and uh, Ryan after that if they have thoughts. Yeah, I, I, I agree with Chris. I, I, I think these issues are, uh, are going to be debated, uh, at least some of them. Uh, I, I think the idea of uh, expanding some of these privileges within the three-tier system is an interesting one. Uh, there was just an article this morning in the Beer Trade Press related to the success or the uh, increase in sales uh, through Drizzly mm -hmm. uh, and through some of these uh, uh, third-party delivery systems. Uh, I, there, there, there is no doubt that there is going to be a debate upon, uh, uh, about many of these different temporary privileges. The consumer will, uh, the consumer's needs will drive a lot of this, but uh, so will the political realities uh, in each state uh, and in Washington. Absolutely, Scott. Do you uh, have any uh, thoughts you want to chime in, or uh, or not? It's okay if, if no. <laughs> no, you know. 
the biggest thing for us is just what is this going to look like? This came on so quickly and, and um, you know, is it going to go away so quickly? I don't think it will. So there's so many unknowns right now. And, and the last thing small businesses enjoy is unpredictability. So having things like the direct to shipping, if that lasts out for some time, as, as Chris mentioned before, um, that would, you know, soften the blow as we start to get back into a normal pace of life someday. Uh, Ryan, what, what are your views on it? Do you view that as, uh, you know, A, A there's the, the policy question of whether it will continue, but uh, we touched upon this earlier, but um, do you uh, kind of uh, see that as a desirable thing and something that, that you might be interested in uh, doing more going forward? Yeah, home delivery would be a wonderful opportunity to keep, but it's not really our top priority. I think we really focus our attention about, around beverage excise tax. Uh, the Craft Beverage Modernization and Tax Reform Act, really making that permanent is really our like number one pr policy uh, priority. Sure. Uh, but uh, it's going to be hard to put the genie back in the bottle, so to speak, in terms of home delivery. And um, you know, I think any, any opportunity to kind of uh, modernize our industry would be, would be extremely helpful. Well, we don't have too much time here. I'm going to, um, one last question uh, uh, that we do have time for. Um, we uh, had uh, uh, a question on what uh, you all's thoughts were on kind of large uh, beer, spirit, wine festivals. Um, and uh, I think also we can lump into that sporting events, just places where a large amount of uh, people gather together. Um, it, you know, how important is that to uh, the industry and do you all uh, know that none of us are uh, probably epidemiologists or, or uh, public health experts, but, but how uh, soon uh, do you think that might be able to rebound or, or uh, take a different form? Um, and, and again, we can let everyone uh, chime in on this and it can be the, um, the, the last question, but uh, we, we can start with Jim. Uh, um, uh, what, what are your thoughts, Jim? Golly, um, sports is very important to beer. There's no doubt about it. It has been for years. It will continue to be. Uh, we're heartened by the fact that uh, I think it was the NBA announced that they'd let their players start practicing in some places that uh, allow gatherings. Um, but we're going to have to be we're going to have to be um, uh, shepherded into this thing through uh, the public health experts and the governors in every state. They are going to be the ones who are largely making the decisions about uh, reopening their economies. Um, but certainly Major League Baseball, NBA, uh, these are important um, ways for our American culture and for each of us to interact with one another. So it's very important to beer, um, but we're going to have to follow the lead of the policymakers and the scientists as they figure this out. I, I think, I think uh, though, whether it's uh, changes to the uh, way beer, beer gets to the consumer, whether it's when bars and restaurants open, whether it's, uh, whether it's when stadiums uh, and arenas reopen. Um, I think beer um, has, and brewers have, uh, and you probably hear the same thing from Chris, I, I think we have uh, figured out a way under tremendously difficult circumstances uh, to keep our businesses going, to try to serve the consumer as much as possible but also then to give back to the community. I mean, the hand sanitizer example is a, is a great one that uh, many, many in spirits have done, but we've certainly seen large companies like Anheuser-Busch and smaller companies like Dogfish Head uh, in the hand sanitizer um, making business. The amount of money uh, that has been donated to uh, groups like the Red Cross and to the Bartenders Guild, um, uh, you know, we have a place in this culture, that's very important. Uh, we bring some joy to people um, uh, in uh, otherwise difficult circumstances and fun circumstances. Um, so I, I feel like beer has, um, uh, has um, done a good job uh, addressing the issues, big and small, that uh, have come out of this crisis and will continue to do that. Chris, uh, what, what, uh, to what extent um, do you think that, you know, spirit festivals um, will uh, be able to rebound or, or what, um, uh, you know, to what extent are, are, are kind of that large gathering um, component uh, important part of the spirits business? And where, where do you, similarly, where do you see that going here in the next couple months? Yeah, I think it's going to take some time. It's going to be a slow build. So that's just why, you know, some of these emergency rulings, uh, we hope they need to stay in place for a while to help 
the bars and restaurants uh, kind of get back up and running. Look, we've seen, you know, ingenuity. You know, I would have never thought of, a, you know, a FaceTime or a Zoom happy hour, right? And that's happening where uh, mixologists are going on and sharing their va favorite drink cocktails and so forth. So the hospitality industry is going to forever change as a result of this. And, you know, and eventually, hopefully we'll get back uh, to where uh, folks can uh, do cheers and so forth at bars and restaurants and so forth. Uh, but uh, it's going to take some time. And I think uh, our industry is going to be, uh, is going to have to adjust with the times. And at the end of the day, you know, our industry, you know, at the end of the day, the consumer is going to win out, right? And the consumer is going to demand uh, you know, great distilled spirits and uh, wine and, and, and beer products and so forth. And we've seen that through this crisis. And our industry does uh, bring a little bit of joy and re relaxation and during this tough time. And I think the industry will ultimately rebound and thrive. Uh, but uh, we're just going to have to take it day by day. Definitely. And then uh, we're uh, one minute over, but just quickly, uh, uh, Ryan and uh, Scott, uh, we'll start with Ryan. Um, you know, are you going to miss uh, the, the uh, I'm assuming you do beer festivals uh, in New Jersey and, and, and sh in the shore area like that. Is that uh, something that uh, you uh, think will hurt your business not to be able to do or does it not make a big, uh, big part of that for you? Beer, beer festivals are a really meaningful part of our business and it's a great opportunity to interact with our customers and fans. And, uh, and on top of that, the New Jersey ABC director gave us special privileges here that allowed us to uh, to like effectively pop up beer gardens uh, throughout the state. And uh, not being able to do that or being able to do that in a restricted manner is um, you know, not ideal. Sure, sure. And uh, Scott, we'll give you a last word uh, here. Um, uh, what uh, extent uh, do you participate in, in tastings and festivals like that? Uh, and, and how do you think that will... Uh, uh, hurt you presumably not being able to, to do that uh, going forward, at least in maybe the way that it used to be done. Yeah, the biggest benefit for us for um, these types of festivals was um, <clears throat> direct interaction with the consumers. And in many cases, you know, in festivals, we were allowed to sell to the public. So it was a try it, buy it kind of situation. And you get to hook some new customers who really enjoy that experience. Uh, so that'll hurt a lot. Um, uh, I actually had one festival in us. Uh, um, in, in uh, Missouri and just reach back and they're trying to schedule now for October. So I think people are dipping their toes in the water for this. You know, if things don't get better over the summer, they'll probably end up canceling it again. But right now we have actually just booked our, our first festival again after all of this in October. So I'm going to cross my fingers and hope we get to continue and do that. Um, the last festival we just did actually it wasn't a festival, but it was a convention. Actually, I'll throw a shout out to Chris was the Distilled Spirits Council Festival in um, Louisville. And there is so much positive, um, you know, collaboration that comes from these things. It really will be a detriment if we can't do those kinds of things in the future anytime soon. Sure, sure. Well, uh, thank you all very much. Uh, we had, a, a, as I kind of foresaw a full hour of talking about this, we probably um, all could talk about it for 24 uh, hours, um, although there might not be as much enthusiasm from, uh, from our viewers. But uh, we, uh, we uh, really appreciate uh, on our street's behalf, all of you uh, coming and chatting about this at, uh, in what is a, a difficult time for uh, all of you in various ways during your industry. So thank you for making the time um, and, and we're going, this will be a recorded uh, event for anyone that is uh, watching. So we'll put it up on YouTube and we'll make sure in the description to put in the URLs of uh, the Beer Institute and Distilled, Distilled Spirits Council and uh, Cape May Brewing and Catoctin Creek. Um, so you can visit each of them. Uh, they're all in their own ways doing some really uh, neat stuff. Um, and uh, we'll keep thinking about these issues at our street and I know all these folks will too. So uh, thank you very much uh, everyone that, uh, that uh, tuned in. We had a pretty robust audience. Um, and uh, thank you very much and keep safe out there and uh, have a beer or cocktail tonight uh, responsibly. Um, and, uh, and thank your, uh, your local producers uh, and, uh, and makers. So thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Great. Thank Thanks, you. everybody. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you. Cheers.